Okay, so this is a continuation to my series of talks going down rabbit holes, why my head hurts so much. And just a caveat before I start, you know, this is not a tutorial. It's not meant to be a tutorial. I'll quote our good friend, Charlie Morris, that uh, it's not a tutorial, it's a log of what I sort of learned, right or wrong, and just ramblings of an old experimental uh, physics geek that uh, uh, hasn't done this stuff for years and years and years. So how it all started, just, uh, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing again, but I'll just give a, little, a one minute overview. So how this all started was I got an Ender 3 printer and I discovered that there's a laser module you could get for the printer that snaps on the printer. Can you guys see my pointer okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so and this laser pointer allows you to go and etch, um, paint off a board uh, or burn paint off a, a PCB board and then you can etch the board. Now, I was intrigued to see how this all works and uh, how these laser modules work because you can get, you know, upwards of 10 watts of beam power. They advertise them at like, uh, you know, 20 watts or 40 watts or even 60 watts, but that's power consumption. That's not output optical power. So I was kind of interested to see how they work. And uh, I found they use buck converters to take, because a lot of the voltages that are supplied to the print head is of the order, I think about 12 volts or so. And these things are typically driven with low, low voltages, right? So they use a buck converter strapped on inside this to convert the voltage, step it down. And they also consume a, a fair amount of power. So that's kind of, this is the map of my rabbit holes. So I started out with laser modules, looked at the buck converter, couldn't figure out how that sucker works. So I had to go back and revisit how an inductor works. And the previous talk, I talked about that inductors, but Lenz's law and uh, Faraday's law and uh, how that all fits into what we uh, hear about inductors. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on MOSFETs because that's where the real reason my buck converter uh, simulation wouldn't work was because I didn't really understand MOSFETs or not really didn't understand them. I um, I did a dull moment. I, I pulled a Homer Simpson and I did some really silly things. So, so the agenda today, I'm going to just talk about MOSFET parameters and how they relate to the buck converter. I'm going to talk about high side and low side switching because this is really important uh, when you look at the MOSFET parameters. And depending where your MOSFET is in the circuit, that's going to tell you how you switch that MOSFET on, on and off. Um, uh, I'll go into MOSFET construction a little bit and then talk about the capacitance that's in a MOSFET. And we're going to look at the, um, I built uh, my own MOSFET model in LT Spice, and we'll test that out, and then you'll see uh, how capacitance plays a role in, in these MOSFETs. So I'll be jumping, and one thing I should note, I'll be jumping around a little bit here, because sometimes I'll be talking about switching, so using a MOSFET as a switch, and towards the end of this, this conversation, of this presentation, I'll be talking about a MOSFET as a power amp. So I'm, I'm going to jump around a, a little bit because as I went through this journey, I wasn't really going through it to learn about MOSFET switching, was I wanted to learn about MOSFETs and the power amp. And in a subsequent talk, I'll talk about uh, the, the, the power amp issues I've been, I've been seeing. So. What I originally did just to try and un understand how a buck converter works was I ran across this design by this gentleman from some university in the States. And basically he designed a buck converter. It's got a, a MOSFET that's used as a switch and he's got some design criteria. And basically the output he's trying to get is 12 volts out, 36 volts in, 12 volts out and 10 amps into a 1.2 ohm load. So I went through, designed a buck converter, put in, in LT Spice, and uh, I can't remember, what's the guy's name? Friday? Was it 
Jack something Friday from Dragnet. <laughs> so in our last episode, you know, I, I had shown this and the output I was getting was millivolts and milliwatts coming out of, of, of here. And it turned out that I was not applying the correct VGS to this. And that was one of my dull moments. And uh, so what, what I missed was that VGS, this is the uh, uh, parameter, the data sheet for the IRF 510, by the way. So the, um, for the IRF 510, the gate source threshold volt, voltage, which is VGS, and that's the voltage that you apply to the gate with respect to the source that turns that MOSFET on. So it's two to four volts you apply to the gate above the source voltage. So for example, if the source is grounded, the gate voltage is two to four volts and the device turns on. However, if for example, the source is at five volts, the gate needs to be two to four volts above that five volts. So it needs to be seven to nine volts according to the data sheet. The other important parameter for the buck converter was this RDS. That's the on state resistance for the MOSFET. And this really bit, bit me in the ass. And so for VGS of 10 volt and ID of about three and a half amps, you get about a half a ohm across the uh, MOS, MOSFET. Now that's important because that is going to dissipate the power. So you can have I squared R losses. So you've got three amps, you know, squared nine amps, nine squared, that's nine times 0.5, which is about four and a half. So you're gonna be dissipating four and a half, four to four, four to five watts with this RDS in this configuration. So this is what um, causes the device to dissipate the power and get hot. So in this case, as I said here for a VGS 10 volts, 3.4 amps, RDS, they said it's uh, 5.4 um, ohms. So I went back to um, uh, LT Spice and I thought, okay, let me kind of put in practice what I learned. And there's two configurations that when you're using a MOSFET as a switch, one is called a low side switch where the, the MOSFET is on the low side of the load. So in this case, VGS, the source here is grounded. So VG applied is relative to ground. So here you would apply two to four volts, the IRF 510 would turn on and that load uh, current would start flowing through that load. Now in the case of a high side, the MOSFET is on the high side of the load. And in this case, as current is flowing through this, current is flowing through this load, you're gonna get a voltage drop across here. So at the bottom of the load, the voltage is zero, but at the top of the load, the voltage is not zero. So your voltage, your gate voltage here, the switch voltage to turn this on has to be higher of of, of that voltage by that VGS, okay? So I thought, okay, let me check this out because basically if you look at the uh, configuration I've got, it's basically a high side switch, right? Here's the MOSFET and this is just the load. So it's a high side switch I've got, right? So I thought, okay, for 36 volts, let me put four volts on top of that pump that into VG and I'll plot VS versus VG and lo and behold, magic happens. So the red trace here is showing the VG, which is 40 volts and VS is 36 volts, which is what's being applied here. So 36 volts is coming across and, and we have a happy cat. The cat's happy, no one's angry, everything's working. Are you guys uh, still with me here? Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, doing well. Okay. So uh, 
So I thought I'd go back to the buck converter and I put 40 volts in, 36 volts here, and I run my sim simulation and I get 10 volts coming out, not 12 volts, and I get eight-ish amps, not 10 amps. So the cat's angry again. Something's wrong here. And so uh, it's another dull moment here. It's I, after thinking about this, I realized that this is a voltage divider. So in a voltage divider, you got R1, R2, and that's the equation for what the output voltage is gonna be, V2, given an input voltage in R1 and, R, and R2. So R1 is the MOSFET, which has an on resistance of 0.54 ohms, and R2 is the load. Now in my simulation I just ran, I had a load of 1K. So half a ohm compared to 1K, there's almost no voltage drop. So that's why it worked out well. However, if you look in, in the buck converter, if you look, clump this load together, and if we just look, forget about the complex part of the, the load, let's just look at the real load, it's 1.2 ohms. So if you've got half a ohm feeding 1.2 ohms, that would explain the voltage drop, and I'm not getting 36 volts here, which is powering the buck converter, because the whole point of this switch is to put the 36 volts here. So I thought, okay, let me go back and let me do another experiment here. So what I did was I said, okay, and I, I don't know why I use 50 volts here. I just had a brain fart, but okay. So I did the buck converter. I put, uh, not the buck converter. I put 1.2 ohms as a load. I fed in 50 volts here. Okay. And uh, I looked at what the VS is. And so VS is here is in green, which is overwritten by the blue. And it's about 30, uh, it's about 28 volts. It's rough, roughly about 28 volts I'm getting here. So I'm not getting 36, I'm getting 28 volts. So I thought, okay, let me use an ideal switch. Okay, turn that switch on and off at the same frequency that I'm, I'm pulsing this on, and I'll overlay that. And let me get smart. I'll put a resistance here and let me calculate what the resistance here needs to be in order for me to get uh, 28 volts. So I did a little bit of math and it turns out to be 0.295 ohms. And so once I put 295 uh, ohms in here, lo and behold, the, the curves match exactly and the cat's happy again. So part of the reason why I wasn't seeing that voltage coming out is because I had a voltage drop across that load and I needed to bump up the voltage that I'm applying to the gate. So the question arises now, you know, this is common for any buck converter that uses a MOSFET. If you've got a 12 volt power supply, okay, how the hell do you get greater than 12 volts to go and power this MOSFET. So I, I did some research and I came across this thing called the high side bootstrap. Okay, and they're actually chips. You can get MOSFET drivers that allow you to go and drive a MOSFET using a microcontroller and it's gonna generate a higher voltage at the gate to allow the MOSFET to operate in a high side switch. So the way this circuit works, and this circuit came from this guy's YouTube channel here. So basically, just ignore this whole, this is just a buck converter circuit. We could just replace that with a load. So ignore that. So the way this works is that you've got a capacitor connected here, and it's connected to a diode um, that's forward biased if the voltage here is greater than the voltage here, okay? So what happens? When this MOSFET is turned off, the voltage here is zero, right? The voltage here drops to zero. So it's forward biased. And so this flows, current flows this way and charges this capacitor up. So this capacitor now becomes 36 volts relative to this point, which is ground, okay? 
So we've got a little circuit, another resistor that comes back, feeds to gate, and a transistor here that shorts this to ground once I put a, a pulse on here. So once I put five volts on here, this shorts, this is ground, this is ground. Uh, VG is below, VG, um, below the VGS threshold. The MOSFET goes off. So it, it charges. Once I uh, turn this off, and this is allowed to now rise up to V-boot, then the MOSFET starts turning on. The voltage here now, okay, is added to the voltage here. Don't forget, this capacitor is charged up to 36 volts. So if this voltage here is at 10 volts, 10 volts plus 36 volts, we're at 46 volts here. So that's the way the bootstrap works. So, and uh, if I plot the voltage here in LT spice, you could see initially the capacitor charging up to 36 volts when it's off. When I turn it, when I turn this off, so this allows to uh, turn on, right? You could see here it rises, and this is showing a almost vertical line, but it's not. It's a it's got a bit of a slope because. As the voltage here increases, the voltage here increases, and it's a cascading effect. The voltage here increases as this voltage increases, so you get more voltage coming across. And the net effect, and you could see here, you could see these uh, tops are going up. They're getting larger and larger as, as more switching cycles happens. So the top here, it's at 67 volts at V-boot when it's on. Okay, so uh, I went, I said, okay, that's great. Let me look at my V-out and my current and look at that. I'm getting almost 19 volts coming out. Okay, and I'm getting about 16 amps coming out here. This thing's generating about 16 amps into that load and it's about uh, uh, 19 volts here. So this is working fantastic. However, here's the problem, is that if you plot VG minus VGS, so VGS, I plotted VG minus VGS, uh, VS, sorry, uh, v, VG minus VS, right? And if you look, it goes up to 35 volts, okay? Now, if you go back to the data sheet for the IRF 510, it's only rated to plus minus 20 volts. So I'm going to smoke this puppy if I was to build this. And this is one advantage of using LT Spice. Why I love LT Spice so much is that you could run scenarios like this and you could figure this out. Now you can, these MOSFETs, you can pulse them, but uh, I have a feeling that uh, it's going to, I'm going to burn this sucker out. So you need some way now of uh, taming this or replacing this with a better MOSFET to make it work. So. In order for me to get my 12 volts coming out and my 10 amps, what I did, I put a voltage divider here and I played around with values and uh, to, a, to this R4, what value of R4 I need to get a, a 12 volt output here. And it turns out that if I put a 1.25K resistor here, I get uh, 12 volts and uh, uh, 10 amps coming out. However, if I measure the power being dissipated in this IRF 510, it's 100 watts. And the maximum power dissipated from the IRF 510 is 43 watts. So I'm definitely going to smoke this sucker if I was to build this. Now, here's an LT Spice trick. If you want to see the power plot, hold the Alt key down and click on the component. So you'd hold the Alt key down click on, on that component and a plot comes up showing you the power. And then if you hold the control key and you click on the trace, it'll integrate uh, or, or give you the RMS val value of the power over that period of time. Okay, so I'm gonna switch now. I'm gonna talk about um, uh, buck, but I'm also going to talk about power amps. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, MOSFET construction here.
So I've got a little video, uh, a little animation that shows how a MOSFET is constructed. It's, it's only like a, a, a minute or so long. So uh, a MOSFET starts out with a P-type substrate, right? Something that's P-doped. And then you have two N-doped regions. And those end doped regions become the source and the drain. Then you add a layer of oxide, an insulator, and then you add a metal layer, a, 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 um, an actual metal layer, and that becomes the gate. So all of a sudden, this forms a capacitor. You've got a metal gate, an insulator, and the uh, P substrate here. So basically, this is one giant capacitor. And that's why a MOSFET draws very little current. It's like an a, uh, op amp. Very little current flows across because there's no direct connection between the gate and this P uh, um, substrate here. So as you go this now, there's if there's an insulated region here and nothing can flow between the source uh, drain to source. Nothing can flow because it's insulated. So now if you start applying a voltage at the gate, what happens? You apply a positive voltage. It's going to attract the negative electrons to the gate. Okay, and it's going to push away these holes. And across here, it's going to attract electrons across there. And you can see that, and that's, they call that the, the channel. You can see it drifting apart, right? And all of a sudden now, you're starting to form a channel. And as this voltage gets higher and higher, this channel starts to open up. And you can see the channel open up. And the minute that this channel is complete over here, current starts to flow, that's your VGS. That's your threshold voltage, okay? So the voltage with respect to the source, okay? And that opens up the channel. And by varying this voltage here, you're basically pinching off this channel and allowing more or less electrons to flow. And there you can see the you can see the electrons starting to flow. Pretty straightforward. Now that's all I'm going to go into in terms of the MOSFET construction. I just want to show you that just how you've got these layers and you've got a capacitor here. So if you go back to this model now, if you look at this, you've got a depletion region here, you've got an overlap, you've got another area here. These are all capacitors. These are all going to form capacitors. And here's a model showing all, all the various capacitors you've got. So this MOSFET is just riddled with capacitors all over the place. Okay. And here's a model to give a, of a MOSFET. This is the gate drain capacitance. And I think that's sometimes referred to as the Miller capacitance. Then you've got the gate source capacitance, and you've got the drain source capacitance in, in here. So I thought, okay, let me get smart here, and let me make a model. So I go in LT Spice, and I said, okay, in my uh, IRF 510, I know what the input, output, and reverse transfer capacitance is. Okay, here it is given in picofarads. Let me create this model. There's my RDS, which is 0.54 ohms. And let me create a model. And let me see how well this matches up to an IRF 510. So um, the, there is a gate resistance, which is uh, small. It's 11 ohms. Now, keep in mind, because you've got all these capacitances and you've got this gate resistance here, this is going to form an RC circuit. And these capacitors have to charge. So that's something that uh, in a uh, power amp, you have to take into consideration how fast, what frequency you're going to be applying to this. So I went on and I 
and I compared the IRF 510. I, I use an AC source and I fed an AC uh, voltage of one volt coming in against this model I created here. And in the model I do, I found some calculations, how to calculate the, uh, the uh, various capacitors here. There's some formulas how to calculate them. I ran across those on the internet and so I plotted it. So here is the voltage uh, divided by current, which is the impedance, same voltage divided by current for the, the green is the actual MOSFET and the blue is the model I created. Now, if you take a look at this, look how close they are. And if you look at the difference here, which is pretty, this is the biggest difference between them, it's about one ohm difference. So the model that I developed is actually pretty accurate in terms of predicting the performance, the input uh, performance of that uh, MOSFET. Because what as I go forward and I look at what's happening in a power amp, basically it's grounding. It's getting grounded at these higher frequencies. The MOSFET is just shunting the frequency to ground because of all those uh, internal capacitances. So where am I here? Okay, I'm over here. Okay, so one okay, another, so thing, another thing to think about, I talked about charging those those uh, capacitance. So if we go back to the buck, so, uh, we do the input capacitance of the MOSFET, it's 180 picofarads. I just did a simulation here with just 1K because I wanted to get a, a slow rise. If I didn't put a resistance here, this thing would rise very, very quickly. I wanted to slow down the rise. So applied 40 volts. So this is like applying 40 volts to the gate and applying 10 volts to the gate. And I said, okay, let's say the threshold voltage is five volts for this to turn on. Well, the five volts, um, to reach five volts, the, the 40 volt, the, the 40 trace here arrives at it sooner than the 10 volt trace. So that capacitor charges up faster to the five volts and it charges up 102 nanoseconds faster. So this is really important because it means that we may have to apply a higher voltage to get that MOSFET to, to turn on. And with power amps, that's why our performance of, of the MOSFET, the power amp, deteriorates with frequency because we have to put a lot higher voltage in to get that sucker to turn on because of the capacitance. So I only have a couple more slides. So, so what does this mean? Okay, so here is I plotted a IRF 510 versus a RD 16 HHF 1 uh, applying five volts across. This is like a low side, right? I'm just I'm just looking at how the input impedance changes here. So if you take a look at this and I plot both of them, and I plot the both the real and imaginary, you'll see the impedance coming into here is purely complex, it's purely, sorry, imaginary. And that's purely coming from the capacitance. And you'll see the IRF 510 has a lower imaginary um, capacitance, um, uh, impedance than the uh, this uh, RD16HHF, okay? And here's an LT spice trick if you wanna look at your Cartesian uh, components, you want to get the real imaginary. When you go into uh, select, you right click on this side of the plot, it comes up, and you go in here and you select and set a bode, you go down, you say Cartesian. And then it's going to plot, it's going to give you the real and imaginary. The imaginary is on this side, and the real is on this side. So what I did was I um, I went to DigiKey and I thought, okay, well, maybe I just need a better MOSFET. This IRF 510 is a piece of crap. So I went into DigiKey and I did a whole bunch of searching. I did parameter searches to try and get 
um, devices with the smallest uh, capacitance, um, uh, drain so, uh, input capacitance. The, the smaller capacitance, the less effect it's going to have, right? So I went and I started searching and I found these devices here. And, and so I, for each one, I did this and I did this the hard way. Sorry to say, I, for each one of these MOSFETs, I generated a plot and I manually measured it at 1.9 megahertz and 14.1 megahertz and I plotted it. Now, in a subsequent talk, I'm going to show you how you could do this a lot easier. Um, so if you look at this, you know, the at 1.9 uh, megahertz, you could clearly see the blue guy, this uh, RT16HHF is clearly the, the winner because the input impedance is kilo ohms, right? Uh, whereas if you go out to like 14.1 megahertz, you could see they're all starting to, to short out. And if we magnify this and we look around the, uh, the 10 meter band, can we say, okay, let's plot the impedance, the input impedance of these MOSFETs around 28 megahertz and let's look at that. And you could clearly see that, you know, 50 ohms is down around here, 50 ohms around here. So you could clearly see the uh, this uh, RD16HHF uh, MOSFET has got, you know, 100 and something ohms of impedance, right? And this, uh, this red guy, which is the SVSH8, you know, they're clearly winners here that are, are potentially good MOSFETs for higher frequencies. So that caused me now to think as I, because I ran across this, I started to think about my D612 power amp and the problems I was having with that. And I uh, went and revisited that. And in my next talk, I'll talk about power amps and the problems I had with the uh, 610 and uh, how I went about selecting an appropriate uh, MOSFET. And that'll lead me into talking about the spectra purity of the output from a MOSFET and as well how to make automated measurements. Because for me to go and run FFTs on every single one of these and manually calculate it, it would take me days and days and days. So I was able to go and do this within minutes, getting the data by using measurements. So at that point, I will say fin.